Right, gentlemen, thanks. You've been absolutely brilliant so far tonight. I'll probably just say to Jan, it's nice to work in front of a nice audience, and that's certainly what you are. I've got to say, listening to Jan, what a, what a fantastic player he was back in the day. And I like coming to these events and listening to people like Jan. I know I played a bit of football. I know you're mainly all cricketers in here, but there's a lot of lads in this room who have also played football. But at the end of the day, we don't fucking bang on about it. <laughs> Your next one, your next speaker, next speaker gentlemen, is a, is a cracking bloke, um, he's a fellow Yorkshireman as well, so you probably won't be able to understand him either. Um, I love my cricket, um, I like a bit of a gamble like Jan, I can tell you if you do want a gamble, um, a, bit of a bit of a tip for you, if you want to put some money on, I can tell you that in the one day international, Pakistan are 29 for 7 in their match against Sri Lanka, which starts next Thursday. <laughs> but uh, this lad is a cracking lad. I'm, I'm from a place called Halifax in West Yorkshire. Uh, Oggy's from a place, it's about 10 miles away, called Morley. Um, if you're not familiar with Morley, Morley is a place where they send the troops to acclimatise before they go out to Afghanistan. <laughs> I, I've not told Hoggy this, but I once went in a pub and it was just by where you were brought up. And just to give you an example of what it's like, I've gone in this pub with my girlfriend and I've gone in and it's a bit unusual for Molly, they're having a bit of a quiz night. And I'm, you've probably picked up already, I'm quite an intelligent lad, mate, so I've got a pen. No, that wasn't supposed to be funny, Greg, but thanks for pissing yourself off. <laughs> I've got a pen and a bit of paper and I'll never forget, it was an unusual quiz, never forget question number one. It was, what are you looking at no bed <laughs> and I got the answer wrong and I got filled in <laughs> again uh, you're in for a treat lads he's a cracking bloke and end of day he's been there and done it what a fantastic cricket I know there's a lot of people in here like swingers so you'll be out very nice <laughs> lads, I'm one of them. gentlemen I'm sure you get up for him being brilliant for you please give it up for the one on the left Matthew Hoggard cheers Roger. have a good night Thanks for that very warm walk. Warm welcome. Um, like Jan, I'll just talk you through how I got into cricket and my experiences and people I've met through cricket. Uh, I keep on getting asked who was my greatest, greatest um, person that I've met playing cricket, how did you get into it and what was your great benefit? And I always say that Lady Luck was the best thing that, that came into my life. At the age of 17, I was doing my A-levels. I haven't played representative cricket for Yorkshire, I'd always been missing the grade. And on the Saturday mornings, my, my day consisted of cleaning shit out of dog kennels, taking them for walks, getting on my bike and going to the local cricket club to play a game of cricket. <laughs> and I was playing 13 cricket at my local cricket club called Pudsey Combs. And at the age of 17, a lad called Phil Carrick, an ex-Yorkshire captain, came across and was lucky enough to captain Pudsey Combs. He said, took one look at me in the indoor nets um, during the winter training and said, what are you doing playing 13 cricket? You should be playing first team. So at the age of 17, I went from 13 cricket to first team cricket in my, my local club. And at the end of the year, there were people getting paid 300 quid a match. I got 50 quid kit allowance at the end of the, get, end of the season. I thought I'd made it 50 quid for playing a bit of cricket on a Saturday. That's fantastic. The following year, I was in my second year at A-levels and he said, what do you want to do with um, your life? I said, well, I want to be a vet. He said, vet, do you want to play cricket for a living? I said, yeah, that'd be fantastic, but I'm not good enough. And he said, yes, you are. And in fact, I'll have a wager with you that you'll be playing test cricket against this guy that's sat opposite you. And during that season, we had a 20-year-old um, overseas professional from India called Vanki Purupu Vanki Desai Laxman. Or as everybody else knows him as VVS. And at 19, he was 20, would never play representative cricket. He wasn't playing first class cricket over um, in India. But by Phil Carrick's constant nagging at Yorkshire and the selectors, he got me into the Yorkshire Academy. And five years later, I played against VVS in a, in a test match. Um, unfortunately, Phil didn't last long enough. He, he died of, um, of cancer before he, he saw his, um, his 
prediction coming to fruition. But we both, in the middle of a test match, I was bowling at him, calling him a spawny twat for playing and missing or edging one down to four. Third man, and just looked up in the sky and said, thank the Lord that Phil Carrick came to Pudsey Kongs, and that's why we're both stood here now. And I played for Yorkshire, um, on the Yorkshire Academy for a year, and I was lucky enough that Phil Carrick told me to go to South Africa, where I first met <laughs> Ryan playing for, for old, old Eds, were you? You were old Eds playing um, where the, um, the, the gym the gym was there where all the pretty ladies came out. Ryan always got out cheaply so he could go sit on the, um, the boundary <laughs> watching, watching all the women go past. Oh, that's his excuse anyway. Uh, I got to South Africa as a, a very young-faced 18-year-old, never been further, further than Halifax, never been on a plane before. It took me 10 hours to get to South Africa, get to Joburg. And you heard all the stories of Joburg. It's the murder capital of South Africa and everything's so big, so scary. And you get to meet Richard Lum, who um, played with Phil Carrick, and that's the main reason I got to South Africa. And I went to the cricket club called the Pirates. And as an 18-year-old, very naive, lucky enough to go to South Africa to play club cricket, my first drink wasn't my last. I was 11 o'clock in the morning, arrived in this club and started drinking. And I didn't stop drinking for six months. <laughs> We played silly games when we went out. We used to go out, we used to go to um, a bar called Long Island Iced Tea that was just up the road from the Wanderers Cricket Club. What a fantastic cricket club that is. And we used to buy eight Long Island Iced Tea for the four of us at happy hours, put them on the windowsill and drink them up and get really, really pissed before we went to Chili's Nightclub. And on the way to Chili's Nightclub, we used to be in cars we used to stop at the red traffic lights, we used to run around the traffic light, uh, the car when the, the red light stopped and whoever was closest to the driver's seat got in and drove. <laughs> <laughs> didn't matter how pissed you were, you had to get in the car. And if you didn't get in the car, you were clinging onto the doors, you were on the roof, you were on the bonnet until the next red robot where you started running around again. And I was lucky enough to play in, in a great side. There was a lot of good cricketers there. And I grew up, uh, I learned how to, how to drink, but I also learned how to play cricket hard. Um, there was a lot of, Monet Morkel and Albie Morkel played in the same, same club at Valtec. And I made um, Monet, um, Albie, Monet Morkel cry on a cricket pitch. I hit him with a cricket ball. And he reminded me that next time I went into bat against him when he'd grown up a little bit and he was six foot five and he was... Um, rolling rather quickly, he said, I'm going to repair the debt. I've never been so scared in my life. But I played two years in South Africa, came back, playing for, played for Yorkshire, and I was lucky that the English weather ruined a quarter-final match against Surrey. We were supposed to be playing on a Friday night, we were supposed to play a quarter-final game against Surrey, limited overs. I had an engagement party on Sunday. I knew it well because we planned it all the way through. We looked through the fixtures. We're getting married in September. We need an engagement party. Another excuse to have a beer. Sunday, two days after the Surrey game, take into account that there's a, a reserve day if we get rained off. Sunday, perfect. No, no cricket for a couple of days. We're going to have a fantastic party. The weather interrupted. The heavens opened and we couldn't play on the Friday. So it was a game on Saturday or a bowl out at the end of Saturday. The Surrey said, it's raining on Saturday, we've got a good chance of beating Yorkshire if we play cricket. It's a 50-50 if we have a bowl out. I, uh, Alex Stewart said, right, then I'm going to phone up Lords and change the rules and we'll play it on Sunday. <laughs> so that's what happened, we played on Sunday. No, we played on Monday. He rearranged the game because we had a Sunday league game on a Sunday. We played Monday. They had a, Surrey had a game down in Guildford. They didn't send the first team, the first team stayed in Yorkshire. Ed Giddens made a stash of cash on the Sunday league game because they played the second team game and they got absolutely trounced. <laughs> but we played on Monday in front of live Sky TVs and everybody was watching the quarterfinals. And I was a true professional. I went to my engagement party and didn't have a drink for the first 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, well, it's not my fault that they changed the rules. And I had a drink. I got to the ground steaming. I was, I was hungover. I was... And the thing is, when you're hungover and you've had a drink, you always do the professional thing. 
because you don't want it to be pointed at saying he's been having a drink, he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. So it was the most professional warm up I've ever done, the most professional I've been. And I ended up getting four for spit. I got Mark Butcher out, I got Mark Grandpa Cash out, I got Graham Thorpe out, I got Alex Stewart out. And all the Sky people on there, they were picking me to play for England. So I got a lot of ribbing from the Yorkshire lads about playing for England. And later on that year, I got the phone call. It was nine o'clock in the morning, the phone goes. And I thought, okay, I'll answer the phone. It was um, the chairman of the selectors, Gravening. Phoned me up and said, congratulations, you've been selected to play, or you've selected in the squad to, to meet up in Lords on the Thursday. Congratulations, we'll see you there. And I said, not now, Mags. I thought it was one of my teammates. Not now, Mags, I'm busy. Put the phone down on the chairman of the selectors. <laughs> 30 seconds later, the phone goes again. Now, now, really, it's David Graveney, you've been selected in the squad to come down to Lords. I said, Mags, I'm busy, piss off. Put the phone down, turned on the shower, just about to get up, phone goes again. Picked it up, I said, look, Mags, really, fuck off. Put the phone down, got in the shower. 10 minutes later, my wife comes to the door, she went, um, I've got a quite an irate David Graveney on the phone, Matthew. Um, you've been selected to play for England, but I think you're gonna have to apologize to start off with. So I was there, I had to apologise to David Graham, but look at it, that he, he forgave me, I said, right, then you, you're down at Lord's. And I get down to Lord's, it's like my Christmas has come true, I get two big kit bags full of England kit, I'm getting to go out into the, the home of cricket, to Lord's, I've got Alex Stewart, I've got Darren Goff, I've got everybody that I look up to on this cricket pitch, and I'm just fantastic to be part of this. And it came to it, the, the day before the game, you normally get announced, you have a team meal at five o'clock, the coaches and everybody else goes through the bowling plans and where you're going to bowl at certain batters and everything else, team plans, who's playing. And they say, well, we can't announce the, tw uh, the 11 because we don't know if it's going to be sunny or cloudy. If it's going to be cloudy, hoggy, you'll be playing because when it's cloudy at Lords, it swings about. If it's sunny, it's a bit flat, we're going to play Robert Croft. So I thought, that's great. I had a sleepless night, woke up on the Thursday morning, walked to Lords. Excellent. Half past nine on deck. We've done a little bit of warm up, a bit of bowling. I'm feeling really nervous. We're going to delay the warm up. Why is that? Well, delay the, the announcement of the team because it's a little bit overcast. We don't know if it's going to burn off or if it's going to come over and be a bit more muggy. And um, so we'll tell you the team a little bit later. So it gets to 10 o'clock. Game starts at 11. Still no announcement. Still don't know if I'm playing or not. Gets to quarter past ten, still no announcement. I mean, Crofty are walking towards the changing room. We've done all our warm up. Do you know if you're playing yet? No. Do you? No. We're looking up, it's still a bit cloudy, it's still a bit sunny. Couldn't tell us who's playing. Half past ten comes, Alex Stewart goes out to toss the coin. We still don't know who's playing. They have a little conference with um, David Graven and the selectors. I'm thinking, well, that's me screwed. I've told them to fuck off during the week. I'm not playing. <laughs> And the toss goes up and it gets announced over the thing. There's a couple of changes. Andy Caddy is in, Goff is in, and our third team is going to be Hoggy. Um, so I, I get my cap. I get awarded my cap walking out to bowl. And I don't bowl in the, in the first opening spell. It's Andy Caddy and Darren Goff. I bowl seven overs in the first, first innings. I get none for 30. I take a catch. Um, but the, the most thing I remember about that is batting against Kirtley Ambrose and Courtney Walsh. I go out to bat and Dave and um, Darren Goff says to me, Courtney Walsh bowling at you, it's your, it's your first time, he's going to try and pitch it up, he's going to try and bowl you or get you out LBW. So I push forward thinking, right, I'll protect my stumps and the ball whistles past my snot box. <laughs> and you could just see Goffy pissing himself at the other end. <laughs> he said, I knew you weren't going to pitch it up, but I just I thought I'd have some fun. <laughs> I thought that's the last time I'm going to trust him. We won that game, um, Darren Goff and Andy Caddick bowled them out for 47 in the, in the second innings and we were chasing 120 to run to win and Darren Goff and Dominic Cork knocked the runs off. I was bricking myself in the, in the changing rooms. But it was luck that I got there in the first place. I then had to wait another three months before I made another test, played another test. I didn't get selected in, in, in another test against the Windies. I then had a stretch fracture of my foot. And look at it, I was picked in the last game against Pakistan at Old Trafford. So we're playing at Old Trafford, and I get my first wicket. Eunice Khan, LBW, Matthew Haggard, just before tea. 
And if it was for the referral systems we have now, I wouldn't have got that first wicket. It wasn't hitting another set. But because the, the umpire really needed to pee, he'd take them off early for lunch or for tea, so he gave him out so he could get off that a little bit quicker. But I've had a fantastic career with England. I've toured a lot of places. My first tour was in India. I've been to Australia. But I was lucky enough to, in 2005 to be selected for, for the Ashes. And the Ashes was a fantastic experience. There's no football, there was no rugby, there was nothing else on show. It was just pure cricket and it captured the nation. Glenn McGrath and Shane Ward had already started the, the War of Words. Shane Warne had already invented a new ball to baffle our batsmen. He only had three balls, but he always come up with a new ball every test series against us that just got our batsmen thinking that it was a magician. And he was a fantastic bowler, but he only had three balls. But he came up with a new ball every series. He was coming up with Graham McGrath saying that he was going to whitewash us 5-0. I thought, I'll join in. I said, um, well, don't know what they're on about. They're past it. <laughs> After the first game at Lord's Wish, they both got fifers and skittleders and they thought that it was going to be um, the 5 nil whitewash that Glenn McGrath predicted. We went to Edgebaston. Lady Luck kicked in again. Ricky Ponting tossed the coin up, made a stupid decision to bowl first. Glenn McGrath stupidly stood on a ball and twisted his ankle. We scored 300 in the first day. We get to the fifth day, we only need two wickets, one wicket to win, 30 runs to get, but it was a piece of piss. Simon Jones dropped a catch when they needed 20 runs to win. I thought, poor bastard, he's just dropped the ashes. <laughs> and as it got down to, to 10 runs to win, Michael Vaughan looked at me and told me to warm up. And I'm thinking, are you fucking kidding? They need 10 runs to win. You haven't bowled me all morning, and you've got Harry and Fred bowling like troopers. 10 runs, I'm loosening up. And Lady Luck had happened. Steve Harmison famously got Michael Kaspervich gloved down the, the leg side. And there's an iconic picture at the end of that test. Brett Lee down on his haunches with his bat on his hands, resting his helmet on his bat handle. The great big gladiator, Andrew Flintoff, shaking him by the hand. And underneath the captain says, fantastic sportsmanship. I was walking past at the time, it says that one all you was in bastard, now let's get to Trent Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so we go to Old Trafford, um, it's one all now, it's, the series is alive, and um, we've had the better of the green at Old Trafford, if, apart from the weather, we've been in a very good box seat, the last day comes, we need to bowl them out to win the game. There's 10,000 people that rocked up on that day to buy extra tickets. It's a sellout. But there's 10,000 people outside Old Trafford Cricket Ground. The roads and everywhere else are rampacked. I waited outside the hotel for Andrew Flintoff and Steve Armisen to rock up from their drunken slumber. I was designated driver as I normally am. They would come down late. We set off to Old Trafford that on a good day is only 15 minutes away. We set off and it's rammed. We're already running a little bit late. Wall to wall traffic. We're going to miss the warm ups. We're going to be late. I thought there's only one thing for me to do. I'm going to go down the outside of everybody on the wrong side of the road to get to old traffic. So I'll go down the wrong side of the road. A bit flying now, a little bit precarious. Get the old cop car. So get pulled over. The policeman came swaggering up to the window, knocks on the window. He went, all right, son, who the fuck do you think you are, Andrew Flintoff? <laughs> and I looked at him and went, no, but he is. He escorted us all the way to Old Trafford. It took us ten minutes. And we, we didn't manage to win that game, we, we drew that game, but the, the thing about Michael Vaughan, and people say who was a good captain, I always say Michael Vaughan, and he pulled us together in the moment where the Australia drew and Australia were celebrating on the balcony at the bottom of um, Old Trafford Pavilion and he drew our attention and said, look, the mighty Australian the mean machine are over there celebrating a draw against England. We can do this, this is our series, they're celebrating a draw, we've got them back to go now. So we go to um, Trent Bridge. Again, we make them follow on. Fantastic effort by England. We're down down to um, 
Simon Jones gets five in the first innings, but he didn't tell Michael Vaughan that he was injured. And Vaughan he told Ricky Ponting to bat again. And who can remember Gary Pratt running him out? It was fantastic. He, super super. Gary Pratt on for the inj injured Simon Jones, genuinely injured, didn't play again in the series. Ricky Ponting, when he was run out, came up the stairs at, at Trent Bridge, shouting and bawling. Uh, Duncan Fletcher calling him a fucking cheat. Duncan Fletcher was stood at the top of the chest stairs, effing and blinding at Ricky Ponting to get back into his changing room because we had a genuine injury. And it was a little bit of bad blood flowing through the team when, when Gary Pratt ran him out. And there's, an, there's another picture of me and Gilo looking at Ricky Ponting that I've got on my, my mantelpiece that's telling him to f off as well. <laughs> and we might. We managed to get down to 12 runs to win. And it's a nerve wracking thing when you've got nothing to do with the batters in the middle scoring runs. Needed 120, we lose our seventh wicket. Garrett Jones comes down the pitch to shame one, knocks him up in the air, caught at mid off. And I'm shitting bricks. I'm going down, I've been watching this game in the balcony, not being able to sit still, shaking, shivering. I get out on the pitch and it was just such an enlightenment. As soon as I crossed the white line onto the green turf, everything slowed down. Everything was peaceful. Every... It's a game of cricket. I've played against these guys lots of times before. We only need eight runs to win. Piece of piss, walk out into the middle, go speak to Ashley Giles. He's normally a voice of reason. He'll tell me what to do and how to do it. It'll be great. Gilo came up to me, he was shaking like a leaf. He said, Shane Warne's turning it both ways. And uh, Brett Lee's bowling, putting reversing, swinging Yorkers, or oh, bounces, and it's fucking quick. My nerves returned. I started shaking like a leaf. And I thought, Jalo, you twat. And I managed to hit a four from Brett Lee. He bowled a ball outside off stump, so I'm told, that didn't bounce. It was a full toss. I had my eyes shut at the time. I managed to get enough bat on it that it went through the covers. And if it wasn't have been for the 10,000 people in the Ratcliffe Road end going, <laughs> it would never have reached the boundary. <laughs> but we managed to knock off the, the 13 runs we needed to win. Massive celebrations. Game at the Oval wasn't for another five or six days. We got absolutely caned at old, uh, Trent Bridge. We go to the Oval. KP smacks 180, keeps her knocking it out of the park. Shane Warne drops a catch. We win the Ashes. We then started the celebrations. We left the cricket ground at about 11 o'clock at night. We went out into town, got in at 5 o'clock. Everybody was worse for wear. We had an 8 o'clock get up for a champagne breakfast. So we've had two hours, three hours sleep. Still pissed when you walk up, but you feel a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more refreshed. In our number ones, we go down to breakfast. Who's sat at the bar not being to bed? Andrew Flintoff. <laughs> Looking fresh as a daisy. And Gary Pratt, super sub, spewing up in the corner. <laughs> so we've had our champagne breakfast. We go out of the hotel at Tower Bridge. We thought there's open top bus ride, there's going to be two men and a dog watching us. We get into the bus, there's thousands of people lying in the streets of London. It is five deep everywhere we go. First stop off, London House. We off to meet the Lord, the Lord Mayor of London. We come out, the Sheriff of London is greeting us. He's got his shiny black shoes on, his silver buckles, white sock. He had a dagger in the top of his sock. He had his black fours on, he had his red robes, he had his white shirt on, his hat with his feather sticking out, he had his chains round his neck, he looked the dog's dangles. We all come out saying, yes, how are you, how are you, how are you, pleased to meet you. Freddie stumbles out the bus, knocks him flat on his ass, <laughs> picks him up, looks him up and down and went, what the fuck have you come as? <laughs> So we have to shove Freddy in the corner of the London house where me and is. We get him back safely on the bus. We go into Trafalgar Square. 
He proceeds to take his young daughter Holly and does a wacko jacko and dangles her off the front of the bus. He's got a safe pairs of hands, but he got a right clout from his missus for dangling his baby over. We get to Trafalgar Square, we meet Stephen Fry, one of my comic heroes. Sorry, Pete, but you're not up there just yet. So we meet Stephen Fry, comic hero. I'm a little bit drunk, and I, all I can say to him wasn't, I think you're fantastic, Glad I uh, I loved you as Lord Mel. Uh, all I could say was, never poo poo, a eh, poo poo, darling. <laughs> And I thought, what a fucking twat, and walked off, quick chat. <laughs> and Trafalgar Square was absolutely rampant. There was people trying to climb up Nelson's column. There was people in the water. It was absolutely rammed. Freddie gave a very drunken, slurred speech. We sang Jerusalem. We got back on the open-top bus to go to 10 Downing Street. We get to 10 Downing Street. They take one look at us. They usher us straight through the house into the garden, where they've got orange juice, lemon juice, sparkling water, still water. <laughs> now I said Michael Vaughan was a very good captain. What happened next makes him to me the best captain in the world. He looked around and went, oi, youngster, come over here. Went, Do you know where they keep the alcohol? This youngster said yes. Went, can you go get us some beers and some wines? Went, yeah, I'll go see what I can do. So the youngster goes off, comes back, Ten minutes later, there's beer, there's lager, there's wine, red wine, white wine, white wine, chill. This guy, little lad's pulled off a fantastic chief. He went, that's fantastic. Come over, lad. What, what's your name? He said, my name's Ewan. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday, Michael Vaughan's lifting the ashes for the first time in 19 years. The day after, he sent the Prime Minister's son to the office to get us some beer. <laughs> Freddie decides he needs to pee. <laughs> he goes behind the rhododendrons. <laughs> we leave 10 Downing Street and I'm happy to walk next to Tony Blair. Get to the opening, big 10 door, the famous black door with the number 10 on it. We walk across the street, there's a bank of photographers. And Tony blows all us. <laughs> I wonder what those want. And I just looked at him and went, they want a photo, you knob. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the God's honest truth. I call the Prime Minister of England a knob. And I was lucky. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I was lucky enough to be part of that and I was lucky enough to have the, the drunkenness and the celebrations and everything else that, that came with it and I was lucky to go on a few more tours um, but I've also had some, some bad luck and I go to India and I wake up in the morning I go have an early morning pee like you do and I look down in the toilet and I think oof I can't remember having a shit last night. And if I did, I'd have flushed the toilet. And there was just this black thing in there. So I turned the light on, and this black shit had a tail, it had whiskers, it had ears. I had a dead rat in my toilet. And I thought, that's not great. So I walked back into my, to my hotel room, I have a look around. There's an apple on the floor, and this apple had been half eaten around the top, it had been nibbled. And I thought, right then, that rat's obviously eaten some of my fruit, climbed into my toilet and died. So I had a look to see where this fruit bowl was in my room. It's right next to my pillow. So this rat has been a foot away from my head, eating an apple, climbed into my toilet, died. I think I'm not happy about this. I go down to reception, plonk the apple on the counter, I said, can I see the hotel manager please? He comes out and says, excuse me, a rat has eaten that apple, climbed into my toilet and died. What are you going to do about it? And true as I'm standing here, he says, I'm very sorry, sir. We'll get you a new fruit bowl. <laughs> <laughs> now, thank you very much for listening to me. I'm very sorry that I fucked it up at the end. I am, I am a knob, but I'm only human.
I eat out the same hole and I shit out the same hole like everybody else. I'm very sorry. I hope you'll have a drink with me at the end of the night. Thank you very much for listening to me and have a great evening. Thanks all that from uh, Kurt Van Gossen and 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 Kurt Van Gossen and